Good morning and thank you so much for joining us again for Lifestyle Gardening. I'm Kim Todd and for today's program we'll be featuring peppers, dry edible beans and protecting your trees in the winter. Also today we'll be focusing on raised beds by showing you a simple construction plan as well as how to install them properly. Our grad student Josh Resnicek built a number of raised beds this fall and he's here to tell us how it's done. All right, so today we're going to talk about the construction and process of building and the purpose of raised beds. Uh, to start off with, raised beds are a great way to make gardening a little bit easier, a lot easier on the back, as well as get away from some of those pest problems, rabbits, voles, an array of different other things, and making soil amendments a lot easier and simpler as well. Uh, with the process of starting and constructing the raised beds, we're going to start with acquiring materials and the right materials. There are right materials and there are wrong materials to be used in the process of construction of the raised beds. Since these are going to be in contact with the ground and soil, moisture, and environment 24-7, they have to be able to last through that process. So we're going to be acquiring treated material, treated lumber, uh, specifically like an ACT, AC2 treatment or a green treated lumber for what's going to be posted into the ground and that's what's going to hold our base stable. Uh, you can use cedar products as well, 4x4 or 6x6 posts. Um, there just comes in the question of price. Along with the 4x4 posts and the ACT, AC2 treatment, we're going to get our runner boards or our long boards that raise the bed up off the ground. Uh, for that, uh, today we'll just be using a Douglas fir product with a treatment of a clear varnish for water protection. You can use cedar boards along with uh, maybe a composite or uh, a synthetic material as well. Uh, but like I said today, we're going to be using a Douglas fir product with a treatment on it to protect it from water. The same kind of treatment you'd use, say, on your back deck or your uh, front porch if you're using lumber. Uh, along with that, we're going to have a couple different types of raised beds we're going to be doing today. Uh, one of them is going to have a vertical vining structure along with it, so it can adapt to a different plant material base. Uh, we'll have one that has a hoop structure, so we can actually put some polyurethane plastic over the top of it and get those plants started a little bit earlier in the season and then possibly even stay a little bit later in the se growing season as well. And then we're gonna just gonna have your classic raised yeah. bed uh, along with that. Uh, for construction of these, just your common saws, uh, screwdriver, and, and then the screws that we'll be using today are galvanized screws. That's just gonna deter from deterioration uh, throughout the elements um, and prolong the life of these beds. So for the construction of these beds today, we're gonna to be getting a four foot by eight foot bed that's gonna sit about 20 inches off the ground. To use those, we're gonna be using, like I said, the four by four treated lumber, as well as a two by 10 uh, construction lumber for the side walls. With those, I got eight foot sections of the side wall beds, so that way we can just cut those in half and use those as our end walls and get those up off the ground. We'll just be screwing those into the 4x4 posts on the end, square and level, and then putting two layers of those sideboards on and raising that up, having a little bit of the 4x4 stick out from the bottom, like I said, to go into the hole for support so that way the bed doesn't shift over time. Like Josh said, raised beds have many benefits. Making soil amendments can be easier, working in the garden can be a little less stressful on the knees, not to mention not quite as many problems with those darn critters. Later on in the program, we'll be hearing from Josh again about installing the beds he constructed. Almost as popular in the home vegetable garden as tomatoes are those peppers. From the mild taste of an ordinary green bell pepper to the fiery hot habaneros, we love fresh peppers from the garden. What you might not know is peppers have taken on a whole nother role in the garden. What used to be strictly for food can now be enjoyed as ornamentals. Let's take a few minutes to show you what's possible with peppers. Peppers 
are one of those vegetables that has actually morphed into something entirely more interesting than it used to be. We used to actually just eat the big green bell peppers. People love them or people hate them. And then from the bells came the orange ones and the chocolate ones and the lilac and the red. Now we have this whole bunch of peppers that are actually ornamental. And they are very beautiful in the landscape or in containers because the peppers themselves are shiny, small, red, round, pointed, dark. This one is actually one that is called black olive. And one of its parents was black pearl, which looked exactly like it sounds, like a little black pearl. These are not, however, peppers that you're going to just pop into your mouth and chomp on because they're sweet. They're not sweet, they can be very hot. You also see how prolific they are in producing their fruit as the season progresses. And the fruit on this particular one goes from a deep dark red to this beautiful brilliant black. You can pick these and eat these, but most people don't do that. A large bushy sort of a plant, this is one that is going to take up a bit of space and just like all the other peppers that we grow, it's one that you're going to want to start in the greenhouse or in a cold frame early in the season. These are most definitely warm season plants, just like tomatoes. You wanna to make sure that you get a good sturdy seedling, get it in the ground. You may have to support it, and that is particularly true of the larger bell types or the ones that carry big heavy fruit. But you wanna give it full sun, and like tomatoes, you also don't want to be sort of hit and miss on your watering. You wanna make sure you give peppers enough water to be able to keep them hale and hardy and, and stop that wilting. The difference in the aesthetics of the plants is pretty obvious between that black olive and some of these ones that are actually eating peppers. The jalapenos, the anaheims, those little uh, peppers that are Thai peppers that are just bite your tongue off hot, the plants aren't necessarily quite as ornamental. You also might be noticing that this time of year as we go almost into first frost, the peppers are beginning to show a bit of a nutritional deficiency, a little bit of leaf rolling, and whether that is in fact because the plants are on their way out or because of high temperatures then dropping to low, because of skipping watering a little bit when, when temperatures got hot, those are all conditions you'll see in pepper plants. They also can be a plant that is susceptible to blossom end rot, we see it mostly on tomatoes, but again, the same issues can occur in peppers, which are related. We also don't want to put peppers and tomatoes in the same vicinity year after year after year. So you wanna alternate, but you don't wanna put peppers where tomatoes grew and vice versa. One thing we also will see on peppers is sunburn or sun scald. And typically that shows up when we have gone from maybe cloudy period in the summer to blazing hot sun. It usually shows up more on the sun facing, the south or the southwest side, or the blossom side. So you'll see kind of this mushy or whitish spot on the pepper. You can actually trim that out and eat it if you choose to. Make sure you get that before it goes into kind of a moldy condition. Again, the peppers like it hot. They like it a consistent moisture. You are going to need to fertilize or consider fertilizing and understand that once that season starts to wane and the temperatures get cool, pepper production is going to stop. Just as there are a wide variety of peppers to choose from to eat, there are plenty of great options, whether it be color, texture, or size when it comes to the ornamental peppers. Keep that in mind for the upcoming growing season and try a few of those cool ones out. Another popular garden vegetable is beans. We love those wax beans straight from the vine because sometimes it's difficult to get that freshness from a grocery store. But we're going to take a slight detour from fresh beans and talk about dry edible beans. Did you know that Nebraska is one of the nation's leading producers of dry edible beans? It's very true and here to tell us more is Extension Educator Jim Shield. It's my pleasure to be talking to Jim Shield today about something called the International Year of the Pulse. Jim, I assume we're not talking about a heartbeat because I don't see any beef hearts sitting on the table. I see cans and I see packages and I see little petri dishes full of beans. Jim, tell me what the significance is of International Year of the Pulse and what exactly is a pulse? Well, pulses are uh, any legumes that are edible, that the seed is edible 
So when we usually think of pulses, we think of dry beans, uh, peas, and uh, lentils. Those are usually the ones that get classed as pulses. And uh, within Nebraska, we actually have a fairly big industry in the western part of the state where we produce dry edible beans. And uh, so we're really looking forward to the International Year of the Pulse and uh, trying to promote dry bean use. Um, dry beans are very healthy uh, food. They're high in fiber. They're um, high in a lot of vitamins. And uh, they're a fairly complete protein source. Why are dry edible beans important in Nebraska and particularly in western Nebraska, Jim? Right, in the western part of the state around Scotts Bluff, probably within 30 miles of Scotts Bluff, one of the market classes that we grow is the Great Northern Bean. And over 80% of the nation's uh, supply of Great Northerns are grown within 30 miles of Scotts Bluff, which makes Nebraska the number one producers of Great Northerns. If you look at all different market classes of dry beans in the state, Nebraska ranks number three. Uh, North Dakota's number one, and we come in at number three. What are market classes, and are these beans used differently? And actually, how does a home gardener differentiate between dry beans and the ones that you buy in a packet and stuff into the garden? Well, really what makes a market class is kind of the, the size, the shape, and the color of the seed coat. Uh, determines the market classes. So like I said, we have Great Northerns, which is a, a large seeded, uh, it's kind of a boxy shaped bean. Uh, and the one thing that makes Nebraska so unique is with our dry falls in the western part of the state, we can produce a very shiny coat uh, dry edible bean. Whereas if you take a look at the, the navy beans, which are grown up pr primarily in Michigan, uh, the, the color and the shininess of the navy is not quite there. And uh, the reason for that is these go into the pork and beans when you get, buy a can of pork and beans in a tomato sauce. So when they're covered in the tomato sauce, you don't need to see them nice, bright, and shiny. Uh, so that's why they're predominantly grown there and not in Nebraska. The other bean that we grow quite a bit in Nebraska is the pinnel beans. And the pinnel bean goes into the refried beans uh, that are so popular in the Mexican dishes. But a little known fact is there is a yellow bean that uh, is also used for that. And in Mexico, this is kind of the preferred bean to use rather than the pinto bean. Uh, the wealthy people in Mexico cook with yellow beans. Um, then we get into some of the beans that go into chilies and things like that. Uh, we have both dark red kidneys and light red kidneys. And again, we grow both of these here in the state. We probably grow more light red kidneys and they're grown down around Imperial. That's the area that they're usually grown. One of the problems with the dark red kidneys is if we have a freeze, we don't get the nice dark color. Uh, they're a little longer maturing than the other market classes. <clears throat> then we get into some of the other ones that go into uh, the, the red beans, the red beans and rice, uh, and then the black beans for the, the Cajun dishes. And uh, then the last one that we can grow in the state is a cranberry bean, which looks a lot like a pinot bean. And uh, the, these are kind of used in some French dishes and uh, they have a real sweet flavor to them. So not only do they have different sizes, shapes, colors, <clears throat> but they also have some different unique flavors that each of the different market classes have. And when we go to the seed catalogs or the nurseries and get the seed packs, um, usually what you're getting is wax beans, and wax beans are a little bit different. They're for the fresh market, they're for the pods. These certainly have the pods, but if you would try to save the seed from these and cook them like you would a dry bean, uh, you're not going to get the same characteristics as the dry beans. But that's not to say a grower cannot get great northern beans and plant them in their garden and then save them for dry use. And, it, and even you can use them for green beans uh, when they're in that green bean sage. So you can use the dry beans for um, home canned beans or home garden beans. 
uh, but you really can't use these for dry beans. Jim, I want to thank you a lot for making that long drive across the state of Nebraska again and for being involved in what is really a cool product for the state of Nebraska. Well, thanks, Kim. I'm glad that uh, you're promoting a Western Nebraska product, and it's been my pleasure to do this today. With Nebraska being known around the globe for its corn and beef production, you might be surprised to hear that dry edible beans are fast becoming one of our most valuable crops. And yes, you can grow some of these bean varieties in your home garden and eat them like you would green beans. Drying them is best left to the professionals. One of the most valuable assets in any home landscape are our trees. Properly cared for, they can add years of beauty and satisfaction as well as shade. During the harsh winter months in Nebraska, they can suffer quite a bit and come out of the cold season weakened. For this week's landscape lesson, we'll be turning your attention to helping your trees make it out of the winter in a healthy condition. We get a lot of questions about whether tree trunks should be protected from damage or any sort of interesting situations during the winter months in the Plains states. And the answer to that is both yes and no. First off, if you are transporting a tree or if one has been transported, it's really essential to make sure that there is some sort of covering protecting that trunk. Not from the sun, not from the frost or freeze damage, but from bumping up against the back of a, a tailgate, bumping up even against uh, a container of another tree in the same shipment. And oftentimes at the garden centers or the box stores, you'll see those protectors already in place. We do recommend protecting the trunks of trees that are thin barked, at least during the first couple of growing seasons or until they begin to develop their permanent bark. Maples fall into that category. We also suggest protecting the, the, uh, the trunks of apples, uh, pear trees, most of the fruit trees really for the same reason initially, because they have pretty thin bark when they're young. Here's the deal on protecting the trunk of a tree, however. There are lots of different ways to do it, and some of them work better than others. What we're after is not only protecting from the damage from sun scald or frost cracking, we're also talking about protecting from rodents, rabbits, uh, the decks of mowers. What you're after is something that is actually breathable, and preferably white, and one of the really, really good ones is a spiral tube like this that has holes punched in it that you can unwind and rewind as the trunk expands. That should go on the tree when it's young immediately, go as close to the ground as you can. Pay attention to the fact that as the tree expands in caliper, this is going to get tighter and you want to unwrap it or unroll it. Craft paper is still available. It is an expandable material, kind of like an ace bandage, and you basically wrap it around the trunk and secure it at the top and at the bottom. And again, you wanna make sure that this is something that you take off after a season or two, or even what we recommend is leave it on during the winter months, leave it on during the months when you're expecting the most damage to that trunk, take it off and put it back on again. Of course, things like chicken wire and hardware cloth don't do anything to keep a trunk from uh, freezing, sun scald, frost cracking, but can certainly keep marauding critters away. Chicken wire is not nearly as good as very small hardware cloth. And what you wanna be aware of is it has to be high enough on the trunk of the tree so that if we get a snow pile, those rabbits can't get over the top. It has to be fine enough and deep enough down so that voles and other critters can't get in from underneath. This is an example of one of the tree guards that I really like. It's got perforated holes in it and it's a spiral so you can unwind it pretty easily, put it on, take it off, and really protect those tree trunks. Let's take a few minutes now to answer our viewer emails. We'd love to hear from you. Perhaps you could share a picture or two with us. Just send those to email at byf at unl.edu and attach the picture as a JPEG file. Our first question actually comes from an Omaha viewer. They have a newly planted Arctic Fire dogwood, which is one of the new red twig dogwood selections or new to this area. They're about two years old. They have done absolutely beautifully. They have performed the way they should, which means that those ex extremely red, like go big red stems are shining in the winter months. And their question is whether they need to start caning them out, taking a third of the older canes 
already to keep that red color. I guess what I would suggest on this one would be let's wait a couple of years to do that. Let them establish themselves really fully. We had a great growing season last year. Hopefully we'll have the same sort of thing this year, but just in case it's droughty, it looks like the structure of these particular Arctic fire dogwoods is pretty good already. I'm not seeing a lot of development of the older, darker colored wood, and I'm not seeing any cankers developing on the stems or even bore holes in this instance. So I'd say let's wait at least a year, maybe two, before you start trying to do the pruning that it takes to, to keep that good red uh, color coming back. And enjoy them, of course, in the winter months. We have a question from the Imperial area, so we're way out west, about using cedars as replacements for pines in our windbreaks. And the question is a good one. It is why should we or why should we not use eastern red cedar or red cedar as a windbreak tree? First off, of course, they're very popular. They're widely available as seedlings. Um, I know sold through a number of outlets in transplant form, so small windbreak size. A real concern with cedar is how rapidly it spreads and how difficult it is to manage. And one of our uh, good scientists in our department in agronomy and horticulture, Dirac Twidwell, has done a lot of research and is continuing to work with ranchers and farmers and people that, that are wanting to control the spread of cedars in the pastures. So I know it's really hard right now to come up with good evergreens as a replacement for scotch pines that we've lost, um, Austrian pines that we may be losing as well in a windbreak situation, but it's hard for us to recommend coming back in with a replacement that has the potential to become even more of a problem than some of the, the pines have with the loss of pines to pine will. So um, I would say no, if you can possibly avoid it, let's not use red cedar as a, as a replacement for windbreaks. This is a fun question. This is actually a viewer up in the South Sioux City area. They want to know how to start microgreens for the winter, uh, for, their, for their salads, obviously, or for consumption of something green and growing and good for you that is not having to come out of a high tunnel or out of a, a, a greenhouse or out of a bag in the grocery store. And the question is, how do you actually do that? It's pretty simple. It doesn't take very long. You need only about an inch or two of growing medium, so this would be a seed starting mix. Ideally, you use flats or at least a container that has been washed and sterilized so you're not bringing in all sorts of other odd um, kinds of, of growies that you don't want. And then you, you, buy, you can actually buy the seed that is already mixed for microgreens. So you seed it very, very thickly. You wait until that germinates. Give it a, a little bit of light. Keep it moist but not too wet so you don't get damping off. And then what you should have, especially if you've either mixed your own microgreen kind of combination or you've bought one that is already pre-mixed, you'll see this nice little carpet of seedlings emerge. You want to wait until you have two true leaves, maybe four. Then take a pair of scissors, chop, chop, chop. Put those on your salad. Eat them as fresh as you possibly can and then they're going to regenerate another crop of leaves, or you're gonna reseed and start all over again. So two to three weeks, start to finish, and you have your own little piece of microgreen salad. As we end our show today, we return to the topic of raised beds. Earlier today, Josh showed you a few useful tips on building your own raised bed. For our last feature, Josh returns to show us how to properly install those beds. After the design and construction of the raised beds comes the setting of them in the landscape. By measuring out the distance between your four feet into the landscape and digging those holes to appropriate depth, either using a tape measure or the end of your shovel to guide you for the depth, you can then set those into the ground. As always, it's suggested for calling 811 to mark any water lines, power, or communication lines. But once you have those holes dug to depth, you're going to want to set that your raised bed in there. And this is where it kind of comes tedious that you want to get 
those raised beds level. So it's going to be putting the raised beds down into the ground and then move, removing them if it's not level. By scraping out where the raised beds touch the ground on the side walls and the end walls, you can then level it and be, have a level surface on all four edges. The purpose of leveling the raised beds is that way you don't get any soil erosion through either regular watering or rain events. When your raised beds are unlevel, anytime you water or have a rain event, that water is going to push all the soil on the surface to one way or the other, whichever way is the lower end of that raised bed. By, by making sure that those are level, you can then ensure that majority of your soil stays into those raised beds. Once those level surfaces have been acquired, you can then fill the bed. Uh, we'll be using a 50-50 mix between soil and compost for our raised beds. Uh, any addition to that, potting mix possibly of any sorts as well as any soil amendments can be used, but we're just going to go with a 50-50 mix of soil and compost. The variety of crops that can be grown are essentially endless by either ornamental crops, vegetable crops, cut flowers, Anything can be grown into those by either, with the use of the either vining structure or even early or late season vegetable crops through the design and construction of a hoop structure with poly covering over the top. So remember, the three key principles with raised beds are the design, the construction, and the installation. With the design, making sure it's an accessible as well as easily attainable and reachable area not making a raised beds too wide that you can't reach the center or you can't reach some of the interior areas. The construction using regular grade lumber as well as treated lumber in areas that are necessary as well as using a water protectant so that way you get away from any rot, potential rots or decomposition of the wood material. And then with the insulation, ensuring you have a level surface as well as your raised beds are level so that way you don't have any soil erosion and then it all becomes the fun of picking what plants go into that raised bed. I'm going to keep those tips in mind because I got a raised bed for Christmas and it's sitting waiting to be installed. So it's already built, I know the benefits, I'm going to install it properly. Of course there are kits you can buy and put together yourself. We think you'll get a lot more satisfaction of building your own. Thank you so much for joining us again for Lifestyle Gardening. We've got another great show for you next time as we'll be looking at the garden as art with a tour of a wonderful landscape here in Lincoln and we'll focus on using boulders effectively around your home. So good morning, good gardening. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time on Lifestyle Gardening. <music>